So here we have the layout of the Large Hadron Collider on the outskirts of CERN. Now you can tell it's large because uh, here is Geneva Airport, typical runway, about four kilometers long. Uh, the circumference of the Large Hadron Collider is about 27 kilometers. Uh, this is an aerial view, but actually you don't see very much from the airplane because it's buried in a tunnel which is on average about uh, 100 meters underground. So, a large part of the effort with this uh, collider has been devoted to trying to find out whether what this guy has written on his piece of paper is right or not. So this is a picture of uh, Peter Higgs uh, in 1965, shortly after he proposed his uh, particle. And uh, if you look very carefully there, maybe you can figure out some of his secrets. Well, what I'm going to do in uh, this talk, I hope, is to uh, tell you what we do and do not know about his particle. I will talk a little bit about what else there may be in the world of subatomic particles that we haven't yet figured out. And I'll say a little bit, perhaps, about how we may discover what other particles may be lurking there. Now, this search for the Higgs boson particle has uh, taken now it's 50 years since the particle was proposed. It's taken the efforts of thousands of uh, scientists from around the world. It's taken the expenditure of, let's be frank, billions of US dollars or Canadian dollars or euros or Swiss francs. A tremendous effort. Why? Well, I would say that the reason for all this effort is because we particle physicists are trying to address some of the very basic questions that everybody asks themselves. Uh, what are we? Uh, where do we come from? Where are we going? So uh, here you see uh, a painting by uh, Paul Gauguin, and uh, these people are asking these questions in, in one particular way. Uh, but I would argue that the aim of particle physics of CERN, of the LHC, is to address these questions, and if you want to boil it down to one question, figure out what the universe is made of. And I think that's something which is of interest to everybody. So let's just remind ourselves of the story so far and how particle physics can claim to address some of these fundamental questions. So uh, on this uh, image here, we see the expanding universe. And uh, it's been expanding for something like 13.8 billion years. And uh, here's one of the satellite telescopes that looks back towards the beginning to try to figure out what's going on and what has been going on since the beginning of the universe. So uh, ordinary optical telescopes can see uh, stars, they can see galaxies, they can see clusters of galaxies, but they can't see back to the very beginning of the universe. That's because the very beginning of the universe, uh, it was so hot and so dense that it was filled with a plasma that is impenetrable to ordinary light. Now, this is actually a rather special telescope which looks back to the emissions from that primordial plasma that fills the universe. But if we want to understand what happened inside that plasma and hence answer such questions as where do we come from, then we need to look inside that plasma, and that's what particle physics does. It tells us what are the fundamental laws of physics that govern the universe at that very early stage in its history. So uh, there's maybe a couple of other people in the audience who are old enough to remember slide rules. <laughs> so here's a very special one with a logarithmic scale going uh, all the way from the size of the universe today, which is about 10 to the 28 centimeters, all the way back to 10 to the minus 32 centimeters, which is the sort of thing that they speculate about at the Perimeter Institute. Roughly speaking, halfway along this logarithmic scale, you've got the human scale. So this is actually a picture of uh, the young Albert Einstein and his kid sister, you know, about a meter tall, on a logarithmic scale, roughly halfway between the size of the universe today and the limit of our theoretical speculations. So, of course, we know a fair amount about what we are made of, what goes on, what went on inside Albert Einstein and his kid sister. 
So uh, we know that matter is made of molecules. We just heard about the contributions of Professor Herzberg to understanding the structure of molecules. Molecules are made of atoms. Atoms, in turn, it was discovered in the first half of the 20th century, are made up out of very small nuclei with electrons orbiting around them. Uh, a little bit later in the 20th century, it was established that those nuclei are made up out of objects called protons and neutrons. And uh, if somebody had been giving the Herzberg lecture uh, 70 or 80 years ago, they might have said that the protons, neutrons, and electrons were the fundamental constituents of matter. Now, we know more than that. We know that inside protons and neutrons, you have objects called quarks. And as far as we know, at the present time, those quarks, electrons of related particles, are the most fundamental constituents of matter. So, as I said, uh, astronomers have their telescopes to see what's happening on the largest scales of the universe. But if you want to understand what was happening back at the beginning of the Big Bang and answer some of Gauguin's questions, like, for example, where did the matter in the universe come from, then you need some sort of super microscope to go and look inside those atoms, inside those nuclei, inside those elementary particles, and that is what the LHC does. Now, in the first half of the 20th century, uh, much of the progress in this field was actually uh, made using natural particle accelerators, uh, distant objects which generated energetic cosmic rays, uh, which were actually discovered just over 100 years ago by Victor Hess. He went up underneath this balloon and discovered that there was radiation raining down and creating showers of charged particles. And it was discovered that among those showers of charged particles were many different types of elementary particles. Uh, for example, antimatter. Uh, antimatter was first discovered in the cosmic rays. Uh, there are particles called muons, which penetrate ordinary matter, but look very much like electrons, but just happen to be heavier. So it was around the middle of the last century that particle physicists realized that if they wanted to study all this gamut of particles in any detail, they needed to study them systematically under controlled laboratory conditions by accelerating known particles to known energies and firing them into known detectors at known times so that they could study what was going on. So those studies with accelerators led to something that we call the standard model of particle physics. And uh, this was proposed by Abdus Salam, originally from Pakistan, whom you see here, uh, and two American physicists, Glashow and Weinberg, in the 1960s. Now, their model made essential use of the ideas of Peter Higgs and his colleagues, but it took another, well, more than 40, almost 50 years until that crucial element in their theory could be confirmed. Now, the first evidence for their theory came from experiments at CERN in 1973. Many other experiments came along later, different laboratories around the world, US, Japan, and Europe, that confirmed many, many predictions of the standard model in quite some detail. So what actually does this standard model consist of? So uh, obviously, there's particles of matter. And uh, here I summarize them briefly for you. On the left, we've got the quarks. There are six different types of quark. Uh, this was established by experiments at CERN in the 1990s, uh, in which Canadian physicists played a prominent role. Uh, I mentioned the electron as a heavier, very electron-like particle called the muon, discovered in cosmic rays, as I mentioned. And there's another one which was discovered in particle accelerators. And then in between, we have the neutrinos. Neutrinos, of course, are one of the primary research uh, objectives of Snow Lab here in Sudbury. So those are the fundamental particles. Then we distinguish four fundamental interactions, forces between these particles. So a couple of them are pretty familiar. There's uh, gravity, uh, which keeps even theoretical physicists' feet firmly on the ground. <laughs> Electromagnetism, which was unified by Clark Maxwell, 
150 years ago this year. And then there are two other forces that operate inside the nucleus. The strong nuclear force that holds nuclei together and the weak nuclear force that's responsible for forms of radioactivity. Now, I like to think of what you see on this slide as, in some sense, constituting the cosmic DNA. These particles, their properties, somehow encode all the information you need to make all the visible matter in the universe. Well, well almost all. Because there's one thing which is lacking on this slide, and that is an explanation of where the masses of the elementary particles come from. The electron, for example, that has to have a mass. If it didn't, then it would fly away from nuclei at the speed of light. There'd be no atoms, no molecules, no Einstein, no us. Uh, there's a particle that's responsible for the weak nuclear force. That particle is very heavy. If it were not, the weak force would not be weak, and we'd all glow in the dark. Actually, life would be impossible. So we need something to explain where the mass comes from, and that, of course, is where Higgs and his friends came in. So let me just talk to you a little bit about these particles that carry the fundamental forces. In many respects, they're very similar, but in this issue of mass, they are, of course, very different. So the first one to be postulated was actually the photon, the particle of light. And uh, this was postulated as a physical entity uh, by Einstein. Uh, actually, this was why he got the Nobel Prize. He didn't get the Nobel Prize uh, because of relativity. He actually got it because by interpreting a particle as sorry, fo uh, light as occurring in particles called photons, he was able to understand the photoelectric effect, how light interacts with metals. A strong nuclear force. So uh, there's uh, a theory for this, which is uh, rather similar to Maxwell's theory, and rather like the photon, there are particles which hold quarks together inside the nucleus called gluons, and uh, these were discovered in 1979 using a method that uh, a couple of colleagues and I uh, proposed a few years previously. So uh, the gluon was actually the second force particle to be discovered. Now, the photon and the gluon are massless particles. The photon always travels at the speed of light, obviously. But what about the weak interactions? So the weak interactions are carried by another particle, uh, proposed initially uh, by Yukawa, uh, that we call the W boson. And this was discovered at CERN in 1983. But this required a really major engineering and technological effort because this particle weighs as much as a medium-sized nucleus. So this particle was discovered. But then, of course, immediately the question arises, where does its mass come from? Why is this particle so different from the photon, so different from the gluon? And that is where Peter Higgs and his friends come to the rescue. So a moment ago, I was uh, talking about uh, Gauguin's questions. So let me now try to rephrase Gauguin's questions in the way that we particle physicists would pose them. So what are we becomes what is matter made of. Now, as I've explained, atoms clearly are important constituents of matter. And in order for those atoms to exist, the electron has to have a mass. So we need to understand where mass comes from, or if you prefer by talking about matter, we need to understand what is the origin of matter. Where do we come from, in Gauguin's terms? Many of you know that uh, in addition to the visible matter in the universe, astronomers and astrophysicists tell us that there is perhaps five, perhaps seven times as much invisible dark matter, which may be made of particles, but if so, they have to be different from the particles of the standard model. Where do we come from? Where are we going? That's the question. How does the universe evolve? Well, the evolution of the universe depends on what particles you put into it. And so it's our job as particle physicists to tell the cosmologists 
what particles they need to think about. Why is the universe so big and old? Uh, it sounds like a somewhat strange question. You might think, well, obviously, the universe has to be big, has to be old. It may be obvious to you, but it's not obvious to a physicist. Uh, and a physicist looks at his equations or her equations. There's no obvious explanation of why the universe is so big and old, but the Higgs boson might provide a possible explanation. And then if that wasn't enough, we also worry about the question of whether there might be additional dimensions of space. So anyway, that is a physicist's day job, to ask those questions and hopefully answer at least some of them. And now we think we've got the answer to one of them, namely the Higgs boson, and it may well unlock the answers to some of the others. So, a little bit more about the problem of mass. So, uh, Deputy Mayor, you will remember having learnt in your physics classes that weight is proportional to mass. Right? Newton told us that. And everybody knows that E is equal to mc squared. Unfortunately, Newton and Einstein, somehow they related mass to other things, but they didn't explain where that mass comes from in the first place. And that's where Mr. Higgs comes in. Uh, and uh, that's his uh, theory on the blackboard behind him. But you probably can't read what's written on the blackboard, so I have it on my T-shirt. <laughs> okay. Now, so... The <laughs> This is where I hope that your laser is not too strong. <laughs> so the first line on the T-shirt, that's actually basically Maxwell. That explains the fundamental forces. The second line explains how those forces act on matter, if you like the photoelectric effect et al. And the third line, that explains how the Higgs idea gives masses to the fundamental particles of matter. And the bottom line, that's the basic no engineering, if you like, of the Higgs mechanism. So there you are, uh, the whole of the standard model on the T-shirt, and the T-shirt is black, so it also explains the dark matter. <laughs> okay, so according to this theory, uh, there is a, a universal field throughout the universe, and just as the electromagnetic field has a particle called the photon associated with it. There is a particle associated with the Higgs field, and that is the Higgs boson. By the way, Peter Higgs was a student at King's College London. By the way, did I mention that Maxwell actually did his work on the unification of electricity and magnetism while he was professor at King's? So, I'd like to give uh, the uh, lay people in the audience Mr. Deputy Mayor, et al. Uh, a, a little analogy for thinking about the way this mechanism works. So uh, here we are in uh, Canada, so it's natural to think of a snowfield. So you should think of the Higgs field as being a sort of universal field of snow. Let's not talk about Ontario, let's talk about Manitoba or Saskatchewan. Okay. <laughs> so featureless, isotropic, Infinite in extent. <laughs> now, now, let's imagine that you're trying to cross Manitoba or Saskatchewan. So that's rather like a particle trying to travel through the Higgs field. Now, if you're lucky, you may have skis, in which case you don't sink into the snow. You don't interact with the Higgs field. You travel very fast. And that's like a particle that travels at the speed of light like the photon that does not interact with the Higgs field. Now, supposing you've got snowshoes on, then, of course, you sink a little bit into the snow, you interact with that Higgs snow field, you go slower than the skier, less than the speed of light, that's like a particle with mass, maybe an electron. 
And then, of course, perhaps you try to walk across Manitoba in your shoes. Not a good idea. You're going to interact very strongly with that Higgs snowfield. You're going to travel much less than the speed of light. That's like a particle with a very large mass. So that's the basic idea. Universal medium, and you get a mass proportional to how you interact with that Higgs snowfield. Okay. What's snow made of? Snowflakes. And so you can think of the Higgs boson as being the smallest unit of snow, the smallest uh, unit of this Higgs field. Uh, and that flaky particle is what we call the Higgs boson. Now, th this theory was uh, proposed uh, in 1964. Uh, by Peter Higgs. Actually, he wasn't the first one to propose this idea of this universal medium. It goes back to many distinguished colleagues in uh, condensed matter physics, uh, and the first people in particle physics were actually François Anglais and Robert Grout. And uh, there was another group, Kovalnik, Hagen, and Kibble, a little bit later in 1964, who came along and also developed the theory. And I would also like to mention, by the way, that there were a pair of precocious Russian students, 19 years old, who a year later published the same theory independently. So lots of people came up with this idea. So you might say, well, why don't we talk about the Angler, Brout, Higgs, uh, Gravalnik, Hagen, Kibble, Migdal, and Polyakov boson? That's because although all these people had very similar ideas, the only one who actually pointed out explicitly that such a particle should exist was Peter Higgs, and that's why it's called the Higgs boson. So that, that, that was a, a sort of a analogy for the, for the lay audience, uh, perhaps for the benefit of uh, any physicists who may be left in the audience. Uh, I would just like to describe a little bit the way that this mechanism works. So this field is represented by this thing phi over here. Okay. And like anything else, it tries to find the lowest possible energy state. And you arrange a theory in such a way that the lowest energy state could be anywhere around the circumference of this, let's call it a Mexican hat. Okay. So of course, it has to choose one particular position around the bottom. And that cho choice of one direction as opposed to other directions is what we physicists call spontaneous symmetry breaking. This is an idea that was developed originally in condensed matter physics and was first applied to particle physics by Nambu. Now, what Angler, Brout, Higgs, Gralnik, Hagen, and Kibble did was that they connected this idea of Nambu to those force particles, the photon and so on, that we were talking about earlier on. And they showed how those force particles could acquire masses by combining with the boson originally postulated by Nambu. What Peter Higgs did that the others did not do, and looking at this picture, it looks almost trivial, is he said, well, you know, but there also has to be some degree of freedom corresponding to quantum fluctuations of the field in this radial direction. So if you like, rattling up and down the sides of this Mexican hat. And that's the Higgs boson. So as I mentioned, uh, this idea was proposed back in 1964. And uh, when the Higgs boson was discovered in uh, 2012, uh, no less a distinguished scientific journal than The Economist uh, came up with a... Uh, history of uh, particles and the years that elapsed between the times that they were proposed and the times that they were discovered. And uh, you can see, well, some of them were discovered pretty quickly. Some of them took longer. Uh, it took long enough for Peter Higgs to evolve in a non-trivial way, <laughs> uh, namely 48 years. Uh, some of my friends have other particles that they would like to be discovered, and I encourage them by thinking that most of them have been proposed less than 48 years ago. So uh, my own uh, interest in this started in 1975, 
And uh, together with uh, colleagues Mary Gaillard and Dimitri Nanopoulos, we wrote a paper. Uh, at that time, all these ideas were extremely speculative, but we thought it would be worthwhile to think what experiments might see if this thing actually existed. Uh, but we were quite cautious. We wrote, we do not want to encourage big experimental searches for the Higgs boson. <laughs> Fortunately, my experimental colleagues didn't take our good advice. So that was 1975. 1984, we first started thinking about the physics that one might do with the LHC. And uh, in fact, uh, with a couple of colleagues, Henry Kowalski and Graciela Gelmini, who are invisible over on the left-hand side there, we uh, wrote a review of the new particles you might look for at the LHC, including, of course, the Higgs boson. So this is one example of what the experiments uh, then set out to look for. This is a computer simulation. Uh, it simulates the collision of two protons along this direction here, produce dozens of charged particles, lots of neutral particles, photons, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, in this simulation, also the Higgs boson was produced, but you don't see the Higgs boson directly because it's a neutral particle that decays very, very quickly. But if you're lucky, you may see what it decays into. And in this particular simulation, it decayed into two energetic charged particles over here and two more energetic charged particles over there. And that's an example of the sort of thing that the experiments set out to look for. However, <laughs> the standard model is not enough. And I would like you to run away with the idea that just because we've discovered the Higgs boson means that there's nothing else out there to be looked for. Um, we have a problem with empty space, which seems to be unstable. We need to understand the dark matter. We want to understand where the matter comes from. I talked about neutrinos. We need to understand where their masses come from. Uh, I talked about the weak force. If you compare it with gravity, it's actually a very strong force. Uh, why is the universe so big and old? There's a theory for that called inflation. Uh, how do we make a quantum theory of gravity? All these are fundamental issues in physics and cosmology that are not addressed by the standard model. So there's plenty of work for the students and school kids out there to do. <coughs> so let me just mention one or two of those topics. So uh, dark matter. So the astronomers and astrophysicists tell us that most of the matter in the universe is some sort of invisible stuff. Maybe it's made of particles. Uh, one idea, the so-called supersymmetric particles. And many of these ideas for particle dark matter, these particles could be produced and detected at the LHC. Now, these particles have to be massive. They have to be weakly interacting. You don't actually see them directly. But they would carry out of your detector momentum and energy. So what you do is you look for events where there is missing momentum and energy. So this again is a computer simulation. You see lots of energy and momentum coming out over this side, but nothing visible over that side. That red line represents where the direction where the missing momentum went. But there aren't any particles there. Well, no visible particles, but there might be dark matter particles. So this is an example of the sorts of things that LHC experiments are looking for. Uh, so far, they haven't seen such events, but you know, maybe when the LHC restarts next year. Antimatter. So uh, Star Trek is responsible for a lot of people's interest in antimatter. Uh, also, Tom Hanks deserves some credit. Oh, we particle physicists are also interested in antimatter, but we don't produce enough of it to uh, blow up the Vatican. Uh, not, of course, that we would wish to, even if we could. <laughs> Instead, we are interested in the detailed properties of antimatter, and in particular, how matter and antimatter differ. So uh, the, the theoretical physicist Dirac postulated the existence of antimatter in the 1920s, trying to combine quantum physics with relativity. 
And he said this stuff should exist with the same mass but opposite electric charge from regular particles. Uh, the first antimatter particle, the positron, was discovered in cosmic rays a few years later. And now positrons are actually used routinely in medical diagnosis. Maybe there's somebody in this room who's been in a PET scanner. The P in PET stands for positron, a particle of antimatter. Now, it came as a big surprise about 50 years ago when physicists discovered that actually matter and antimatter do not quite behave equally and oppositely. And it was suggested that this might have something to do with the fact that we have matter in the universe today, but no large amounts of antimatter. And this is now something which is being actively explored by experiments at the LHC and elsewhere. Uh, here's Einstein again. So, sort of young kid, uh, looking maybe a little bit unhappy. Uh, perhaps he was unhappy in this picture because he had intuition that he would not succeed in making a unified theory of the fundamental interactions. That was what he was working on in his latter decades, but he never succeeded. But one of the ideas that he worked with was the idea that there might be additional dimensions of space. And this is an idea that's come back into fashion in recent years, in particular with an idea that you may have heard about, string theory. So this is something also that we're looking for at the LHC. And uh, in some theories with extra dimensions, gravity becomes a strong force at LHC energies. And it had been suggested by some crazy theoretical physicists that the LHC might be able to produce microscopic black holes. So uh, this created a certain amount of anxiety among some people, um, but this theory also predicted that these black holes would vanish instantly. And uh, I actually have a secret theory that this whole story about black holes was invented by the CERN press office to attract more attention. <laughs> anyway. Let's move on to the Large Hadron Collider. So here we are underground. Uh, so I remind you that the machine has a circumference of about 27 kilometers. Uh, these are some of the thousands of magnets that uh, guide particles around. Uh, when it's in operation, you've got thousands of billions of protons. Each of them has approximately the energy of a fly. And uh, when the thing is going full blast, uh, you could use something like a, a billion collisions per second. And uh, with that, we hoped to understand the origin of mass. We think we do. Uh, we hope, perhaps soon, to understand the nature of dark matter. Experiments trying to understand the primordial plasma that filled the universe, and also to understand this difference between matter and antimatter. So, those particles go round and round in circles. We want the particles to collide with each other, not with molecules of gas. So it's very important that uh, inside those tubes you have a very good vacuum, and uh, a lot of effort went into ensuring that the vacuum in the tubes was better than on the surface of the moon. Now, in order to keep the particles going around, even when they have very high energies, you need very powerful magnets. Uh, to make a very powerful magnet, you have to cool it to a, a very low temperature. And uh, I like to uh, joke that uh, particle physics is cooler than cosmology <laughs> because those magnets are cooled down to 1.9 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, that's even colder than Timmins. whereas outer space is only 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. So particle physics is 0.8 degrees cooler than cosmology. OK, so uh, it's one thing to have an accelerator. You need some experiments. And there are four major LHC experiments. Uh, ATLAS and CMS, they co-discovered the Higgs boson. They're now looking for dark matter. Uh, ALICE, that studies of primordial cosmic plasma, and LHCb, this is the one understanding the uh, matter-antimatter difference. And uh, Canada is playing a, a prominent role in the LHC program. 
Specifically, uh, Canada is uh, playing an important role in the Atlas detector, which you see here. So, uh, let me now come forward to uh, 2011. Uh, in 2011, this was what we did not know about the Higgs boson. So we did not know that it was in this range going up to 100 and something GeV. Those are our mass energy units, a little bit larger than the mass of a proton. So it couldn't be less than, let's say, 114 of those units. And there was a region here where experiments in the United States had demonstrated that it could not exist, somewhere around 160, 170 GeV. There are other indirect indications that uh, probably it wasn't very heavy and more likely it was very light. So uh, this is what physicists would call a chi-squared distribution. The minimum of the chi-squared tells you the most likely value and well, it was, came out rather small. Uh, the prediction was that the mass of the Higgs boson should be around 125 plus or minus 10 GeV. That was before the LHC got started. So later in 2011 and the first part of 2012, the LHC experiments, Atlas and CMS, started seeing some interesting events. So this is one example from the Atlas detector. So I showed a simulation earlier on where the Higgs boson decayed into four very energetic charged particles. So this is a real event now, not a simulation, which has the same signature. So one energetic charged particle going up there, another one over there, and two more down here. So to a particle physicist, that looks exactly like what we would expect a Higgs boson might do. Here's another example. So this is from the rival CMS experiment. And uh, here we have two energetic photons. So they're, they're not charged particles because they don't leave tracks, but they deposited a lot of energy, and Higgs decay into two photons. That's one of the expected signatures of the particle. In fact, that was something that we calculated back in 1975. So events of this type started accumulating, and that's what led on July the 4th to the announcement of the discovery of a new particle. So this is a picture of the uh, CERN auditorium after the experiments presented their results. Lots of happy physicists, and I would like to pay particular credit to this man here, Lynn Evans, who was the guy who basically built the LHC accelerator. And uh, here we have a picture of Peter Higgs and Francois Anglaire, the guy who shared with him the Nobel Prize uh, last year. So they had independently proposed this theory back in 1964, but in the intervening 48 years, they had never met. And this was when they actually said, hello. Or, <laughs> or maybe in the case of Francois Anglaire, bonjour. So what has actually been seen? So I showed you a few interesting events, but on the basis of one or two events, you can't tell. You have to do a statistical analysis. And so this is a combination of the Atlas and uh, CMS results. So what's been done here is to subtract off uh, of the garbage, what we call the background in physics language. So if this is close to zero, that means there's nothing very much going on. So indeed, on this picture, you see no Higgs on the left, no Higgs on the right. But what happens if I remove this blind here? And what you see is a dramatic peak, extremely significant, clearly a new particle. And of course, the question is, is this the Higgs boson finally emerging from the background? So there's a nice little animation that's provided by the Atlas experiment that shows how the signal grew uh, with an increasing amount of data. So over here on the left, you see a peak. That's a well-known particle decaying into four charged particles. Here are pairs of that particle also decaying into four charged particles. All this was well-known. 
But in the middle there, you see another peak. And that other peak there, that is the Higgs boson. And it looks very convincing when you put a histogram underneath it. <laughs> so that was one piece of evidence from one of the two experiments. Put everything together, unquestionably, a new particle. So of course, then the question arises, is this new particle the thing that you've been looking for all these years? So I like to compare this to uh, doing a, a jigsaw puzzle, uh, a puzzle that particle physicists have been working on for over 100 years, and they've been missing this piece. And then finally, you know, underneath the sofa, you discover a bent piece of cardboard, the picture's been rubbed off. Is this the missing piece? Does it have the right shape? Does it have the right size to fit into the puzzle? So this is one of the issues that we've been studying over the last couple of years. So in, uh, in physics language, does it have the right shape? That becomes the question, does it have the right spin? Uh, the Higgs boson should have spin zero. It should be completely isotropic, just like Manitoba. Uh, but, but, but maybe it has spin two. Well, the answer is it has spin zero. Spin two is very strongly disfavored by the data. Then you could ask yourself, OK, it has spin zero, but is it an elementary particle like all the others? Or maybe it's made up of smaller things inside. So far, there's no hint of that, as I will show on the following slide. Then this particle is supposed to give masses to other particles. Is there evidence that it really connects to other particles, couples to other particles, proportional to their masses? And yes, there is. So uh, for that reason, uh, with my student, Tivong Yu, we wrote in a paper we published last year, beyond any reasonable doubt, it is a Higgs boson. So this is one picture from our paper. So uh, these are the couplings of this particle to other standard model particles. The standard model prediction is that little green star there, and that's you know, what the data seem to indicate, certainly consistent with that. Does it couple to other particles proportional to the masses? So the standard model prediction is that red line. This, these little symbols here represent our fit to the data. Seems to agree. So on the basis of that, we wrote in another one of our papers that this particle walks and quacks like a Higgs boson. So Peter Higgs can smile. So uh, towards the end of last year, the Nobel Prize Committee announced that it was awarding the Nobel Prize to Peter Higgs, whom you see here, and Francois Anglais, whom you saw uh, a few minutes ago. And uh, in their explanation of why they decided to give them the prize, they wrote, today we believe that, quotation marks, beyond any reasonable doubt, it is a Higgs boson. So my student and I were very proud because this quotation was actually taken from our paper. But what the Nobel Prize Committee didn't know was that the referee for our paper said, beyond any reasonable doubt, is not a scientific term. You have to take that out of your paper before publication. <laughs> so this phrase does not appear in the published version of our paper. <laughs> so I, I'm getting you know, close to the, to the end of uh, my talk, and I'd just like to make a, a few remarks. So one remark is that uh, this type of research, as I tried to emphasize in the beginning when I made the connection with Gauguin's questions, is something which is truly of universal interest. And indeed, particle physics is a truly global venture. So this is a, a map of the world showing the passport nationalities of people working at CERN. So there's something over 10,000 of them and uh, over here, somewhere, you will see Canada. Where do I see Canada? Canada, here, yes. So 135 Canadians were, rep uh, were registered uh, on this particular date 
as doing experiments at CERN, many of them uh, on the ATLAS experiment. So, a lot of effort. And uh, as I tried to explain earlier on, uh, in my humble opinion, the Higgs discovery is or was a big deal. Uh, if there was no Higgs, the electrons would have no mass and there would be no atoms. Uh, if there were no Higgs, uh, there would be no masses for quarks, no heavy nuclei. Uh, the weak interactions would not be weak because the particle responsible for radioactivity would be massless like the photon. So, like I said, the existence of the Higgs boson, in my opinion, is a big deal. So what else is there? Uh, is the Higgs boson all there is? So I would say no. And in fact, earlier on, I told you that the standard model is not enough. And uh, I already mentioned the, the S word. Uh, supersymmetry is a theory that many of us particle physicists like very much. Uh, it could explain uh, the dark matter. It could help us unify. It enables us to predict the properties of the Higgs boson. And certainly I am on tenterhooks for the next run of the LHC to see whether supersymmetry is finally discovered. So what are the next steps in this particle adventure? So uh, the LHC will run for another 10 or 20 years. Uh, the energy is going to be increased next year. The collision rate eventually will be far larger than what it is today. Where do we go after the LHC? So there's various ideas for building larger colliders, either linear or circular. And uh, these are now being studied more and more intensively by the particle physics community. And uh, to those of you like uh, Ken, who like Geneva, we've got a couple of options in the neighborhood of Geneva. Uh, for example, why not build an accelerator around Geneva, uh, under the lake and between the neighboring mountains? So at the moment, this is just you know, a paper study, but uh, you know, you have to plan these things well in advance. I remind you that the LHC was first discussed 30 years ago. Uh, what other experiments can you do? Well, you could look directly for dark matter. And uh, this is a picture that actually uh, Nigel Smith, the director of Snow Lab, showed in his technical lecture earlier on today. And uh, these are various different experiments that are looking or will be looking for dark matter. Uh, so there's several of them that are or will be located in the uh, Snow Lab uh, facility, uh, Super CDMS, uh, Deep, uh, Pico, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is certainly something in which you have a, a very direct local stake. So that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. I hope I've convinced you that the LHC is not only the world's most powerful microscope for looking deep inside matter and informing us better about what we are, but also it is in some sense a very powerful telescope enabling us to go back and look at some of the most fundamental problems in cosmology. Where does the matter in the universe come from? What is the nature of dark matter? Thank you.